Hello and welcome back to Kairos. I am here today with Peter Noble. Pete, good to have you here. Oh, good, good to be had. And um, Pete is the vicar here at the church where I serve as pastor. So for those of you outside of Lutheran circles, a vicar in our system is basically a pastor in training. So Pete's just coming to the end of his vicarage and God willing, he'll be ordained as a pastor in the Lutheran church in a couple of months time. We look forward to that. And uh, today I just wanted to get him on to talk a bit about his journey uh, through life and particularly into, um, into ministry. So we'll get into it. Hey, Pete. Let's do it. Let's do it. So let's start at the start. Childhood, what sort of family did you grow up in, Pete? Um, yeah, so I was born in um, uh, Lidcombe, Sydney, <clears throat> and I was uh, I moved to Katoomba when I was two weeks old, and I was raised in the Pentecostal Church, so an AOG uh, congregation in Katoomba um, for most of my life, and then... Um, I think like most uh, rebellious teenagers, uh, I rejected, well, I didn't, I'd probably, I wouldn't say I rejected religion, but I went on my own sinful um, desire uh, binge and I uh, got involved with um, graffiti culture at about the age of 14. And that kind of progressed, you know, with, you know I was skateboarding as well. And that progressed up until um, probably... I was kind of on and off with my faith. I was going to youth camps a lot. Um, a little bit involved with the Anglican church in Lawson. Mm -hmm. It was called Grenade Fishing at the time. That was an interesting name. And, um, but there were some really uh, amazing people that um, uh, basically <clears throat> spoke into my life with God's word. Um, Albie and Clark is one of them. He was the youth pastor there. But um, yeah, involved with graffiti and just kind of, that kind of took a strong hold of my life. Uh, right up until the age of 19, and um, when I was 18, I moved out of home, I tried some apprenticeships, I, I moved to Penrith for about a year, had trouble in my life, and just um, obviously with graffiti and <clears throat> relationships, and then I moved to uh, my grandmother's house for about, about a year, or maybe even less than that, maybe like six months or so, and that was in uh, Cranebrook on the other side of Penrith, and so... Um, around that time, I met um, my wife, who, who is my wife today, but I met a girl called Altamira at the time, and uh, I, I got into a lot of trouble uh, with this whole graffiti culture. That kind of let's yeah. just go back a step yeah. with that. I mean, um, for those of us who aren't as familiar with graffiti culture, like so, uh, I mean, I mean, are we are we talking, you know, a few um, crayons on the on the wall here, or what? What, what does this actually look like without um, without glorifying it? Obviously, but... sure. Yeah, it's a yep. Yeah. So so graffiti culture is, um, yeah, when, when people think of graffiti, they think of uh, a tag on a wall. Um, that is one small element of it. But what I, when I mean graffiti, I mean, <clears throat> I mean like um, proper pieces and um, artworks that, are, uh, that require um, multiple colours, uh, backpacks full of paint. <clears throat> but I specifically mean um, with the stuff that I was getting involved with was um, a lot more, uh, I was um, probably a bit of a thrill seeker. In some aspects, there's, there's there's different psychological reasons why people do graffiti. Um, one is for fame. One is for just to get your artwork up, um, you know, for political reasons, these kinds of things. But um, other people do it for the psychological thrill of it. Mm -hmm. um, I was probably a bit of a quiet, underachiever kind of character, um, even though I'm a bit extroverted. But, but basically, um, yeah, uh, the stuff that I was doing was getting involved with um, graffiti, uh, and I was doing... Um, I would do a lot of um, uh, trains, and so we, it, was, it was, it's almost kind of espionage, like covert missions into train yards with backpacks of paint, sometimes with friends, sometimes alone, but um, yeah, and we would take, you know, we would come prepared with bolt cutters and things like this, and so we would gain access through, you know, uh, through different levels of security to access trains um, during the early hours of the morning, mm. scoping out security shifts, these kinds of things, so that you don't get caught. And um, it was getting quite hard back in the day, uh, in my day, um, coming up to, so probably from like 2004 to maybe 2006 was probably like my most active times. And... Um, yeah, and about yeah, that's, that's pretty much so they, the yeah, stuff I was involved with. And there really is a, cult, a culture behind it, not just yeah. the occasional sort of um, tag on a wall and that right. sort of thing. And and it also happens to be illegal, of course. And so, how did this all end up for right. you? Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so, I think I, I really came unstuck when about the age of nineteen, when um, 
not quite quite recently after I met Altamira, um, it was 2006, I think, um, I think it was August or something like this, uh, that, uh, that year, that I ended up um, getting my house raided by 12 undercover cops. And so um, I had just come back from Queensland doing uh, painting with a um, bunch of guys up there, interstate, <clears throat> and basically um, what I didn't know at the time was that I was being monitored by uh, the RVTF, which is the Rail Vandalism Task Force. Yeah. So they're kind of like a New South Wales police force f group that basically investigate um, rail uh, train crimes. And so they were, <clears throat> um, obviously graffiti was quite big at the time and they had been following me or investigating me for at least six months. You had and no idea of this. I didn't know this, mm. but I knew I was suspicious of something. Um, I hadn't been caught doing graffiti, um, but uh, it was later revealed to me by the prosecuting officer that a girl that I was in an inappropriate relationship with had gone to the police with some photos of graffiti that I'd done. And so um, I must have left them on her computer and I don't know the, um, I don't know the full um, mm. f truth about it or the facts. I mean, the facts are that the, the, the photos went to the police. Whether, I can only speculate whether she did it off her own intention mm. or her mother coerced her, I don't know. Um, heck, and it, of a, heck of a way to get back at a boyfriend. <laughs> that's pretty much it. And so um, I think she was jealous uh, that I was hanging out with another girl. But basically, um, yeah, it's, it's a long story short. And then uh, they had to kind of reveal that to me because she... It was revealed to me after I was when I was charged that she was the crown witness of the case and was mm. moved interstate. It was kind of like underbelly or something, mm. because they're like, oh, um, <clears throat> I don't know if it was for her own protection or what. But um, this court case, I was originally charged with, um, I think it was seventeen or or, or, or um, eighteen charges of malicious damage, because they found a bunch of photos at my house. They didn't really find any spray paint as such, because I I was yeah I think I got rid of a lot of it. I imagine with that amount of stuff, you could potentially go to jail with this sort of thing. Well, yeah. So, um, yeah. And then the the charges went from um, after I was charged and released on bail, I received more charges in relation to other um, offences, malicious damage offences. And it went from like 17 to like 23 to 25. And then it got to like 27 in the end. <clears throat> and so... That was the beginning of a long period, a very slow and grinding period of my life where um, it's not fun being on bail, it's not fun knowing that there is um, ramifications for your behaviour and that there's going to be a consequence and that justice is going to be served to you in some way. And I was just thinking to myself all through that period, like, uh, well, at least at the beginning I was like, how can I get out of this, <laughs> you know? Did you have any sense of, like, <coughs> God at this stage? You know, you say well, yeah, you sort of moved yeah. away, but what was your conscience doing and all Yeah, that's right. I mean, I always had a... Um, every time... What I can say is um, um, I, what, I was never baptised as a child, but um, uh, the lectionary reading for this week is actually John 3, and it says um, that the wind or the spirit blows, but we don't know where it, where it comes from or where it's going. Mm. And it's interesting because I would say that all through my childhood... Um, I would say that I was a Christian because I accepted Jesus into my heart as a four-year-old with my mother and that's a whole other story. But I remember being convicted of my sin all through my graffiti career. Mm. Every time I went to paint a train, I, my heart always sunk and I felt so convicted and I intentionally stepped over that conviction. And I would say it was the Holy Spirit convicting me mm. about this sin. And, um, and, 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 yeah, and I just remember thinking, or why do I always feel like this, you know? And I tried to suppress that as much as I could with my human initiative. But, um, but after I was arrested and I was on bail, I really got to the point where I arrived at the conclusion that my life was not in my control anymore. And that I had come to a point where um, I realised that if I continue on this pathway, that ultimately it will result in a, <clears throat> a financial or physical loss um, um, and these kinds of things, but ultimately sin leads to death. I've had a real conviction about this. Um, and so I, I really did a lot of soul searching. And I remember Alts of Mira at the time, she invited me to come to her church. It was um, in Windsor. It was like a Pentecostal church out there. And I started coming along. I got involved with that church and the lifestyle there. Um, I would say that I repented of my sin. 
and God was being very gracious and teaching me um, the gospel. And what it meant, to, um, well, Altamira was very practical in that sense. She was the hands and feet of Christ to me and, and really discipling me. And just um, not so much through what she said, but just how she lived. She lived in accordance with the word of God and she lived like a Christian would live. And so I find that um, not just spiritually attractive, but also um, mm. f physically attractive. Mm. And so we had a strong friendship, even though there was no, no connection. Um, she wouldn't let me date her for like at least a year. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Um, Pentecostals, uh, I have a lot of respect for the, uh, the Pentecostal denomination because they, they have a lot of um, practical theology around these things. So she had a strong understanding of like, um, uh, even though she has, doesn't have a Christian background growing up, she had a strong understanding of um, a theology of dating and what is practically acceptable. So, so she um, would only have become a Christian in the last few years or something? Yeah, or something? like yeah. maybe like a year or two before yeah. I met her. And so she had uh, enough... Uh, Christian uh, th theology and maturity to be able to discern what was appropriate and what was mm. not and and all these kinds of things. And so I really respected her so much more because she was kind of, would state it explicitly. Mm. Um, and so we hung out a lot, but it was always above board and we would go to like a cafe and talk and things like this. And so she demonstrated what Christian living looked like. Mm. And so I would pursue that. And in pursuing her, I, I really was pursuing Jesus more so mm -hmm. and getting my life in order. And in the and, meantime, you're still sort of on bail or waiting that's to hear right. back from the court or that sort of thing. That's right. And so I basically, um, uh, one of the big things that happens that was, um, I would say, from God or a God initiative is that, um, so my, um, I crashed a car that I had a loan for. It was like a Skyline or something. I crashed that not long after I was arrested. Um, it was just a small ding, but it was enough to, I, I hit a tow bar and it put the car out of function, the radiator was leaking and it was just, it was a mess. I had a car that I owed money on. I was only working a couple days a week and so I was stuck in this legal um, limbo where I was applying for legal aid, but I was just earning too much over the threshold and all my money that I was earning was just going on my uh my, uh, car, my repairs. car repairs and things like this. So I had like, no money to show for what I was doing. And, um, and so I couldn't get legal aid, but I couldn't afford a lawyer. I was in this strange place. It was very, very frustrating. And I remember telling Altamira this, and I remember she said to me, um, she came to me one day and she just said, I really feel led um, by the spirit or, 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 or in my conviction to loan you some money. And it, it might have been all the savings that she had at the time. She was also a student finishing her bachelor of education in primary or something and she gave me this money and she said look um as long as you pay it back i'm happy to give it to you now and that was like a real defining moment because i had been praying for god to 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 like to deliver me and mm -hmm. i said look i was kind i don't think i ever prayed a prayer like god i'll give you my life if you save me but i just said lord deliver me from this mess and from this this um, sinful lifestyle that i've made for myself and um it was like this was an objective gospel, um, to speak in Lutheran terms, it was, you know, outside of myself and it was like the gospel came to me and it was given to me and it was like receptive. All I did just did was receive it and I, I didn't do anything to earn it. And, um, and so I used that money to hire a lawyer and um, Jason Hanna was his name. He was a, a, a wonderful man and, uh, and he represented me. And uh, basically um, he struck a deal. Uh, we ended up striking a deal with the prosecution in the court case. The court case went, it was, it was being, um, def what do you call it, uh, adjourned for almost two years. It went on for, wow. this is how long it went for. So mm -hmm. it's just, again, nothing happened fast. And so, because um, I couldn't get legal representation, it kept getting adjourned. And it's like the lawyer came in at the last 11th hour and, you know, this money showed up and it just, God just was, I felt like um, what the lawyer said to me, his legal advice or was, he said, um, yeah, I wouldn't say that I was a particularly um, cunning or, um, you know, uh, a person with, um, you know, ill will or intent, you know, like I never want to hurt people. But, um, you know, it's interesting because art does damage people. It's vandalism and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But um, I remember him saying to me, he said, oh, Pete, um, in terms of legal language, it's not the, um, I was um, looking at a jail sentence because he said, you know, so remember it was 27 charges of malicious damage. He said, it's not the, it's not the nature of the offence, he said, but the volume of the offence. Sure. And I remember the prosecutor saying to me, the head prosecutor who um, ran the, who was, who was pushing the charges and was looking to get justice, he, he, he commented to me, uh, 
He said, Pete, if I had my way, uh, I would have charged you with 500 charges of, of malicious mm -hmm. damage. But my police, um, my police station and, and, and my, um, my capability that we have in our team, we don't have the resources to mm. physically do that. And so I was just like, wow, there's like already an act of grace there. But presumably, I can imagine too, with the culture you described and the focus on this in New South Wales, that maybe they want to make an example of someone as well and, and send a message to the community. That, yeah, that's right. Know. Actually, and I, now I remember um, the prosecuting officer, um, I had him on a first name basis. He's a good guy. Um, we sort of became friends in one sense. Uh, it's very strange. I'll comment on maybe on that at the end. But you didn't, you didn't go to jail though, right? No, I didn't go to jail. And um, But I remember the, the, the prosecuting officer was saying to me, oh, you're lucky, Pete, because that day that we raided your house, he said the um, a current affair or someone or 60 Minutes was supposed to come down mm. and meet us at the address, mm. but for whatever reason, they just didn't show up. Mm. And so you said, you know, you know, my face could have been on the news and it just would have been one of those stories where you just get your name smeared everywhere. Yeah. But again, by grace, it just didn't happen. And so I don't know why it didn't happen. He didn't know why it didn't happen. It just didn't occur. And so um, where are we going here? We're talking about... You didn't end up in jail. Didn't end up in jail. And so... Um, the, uh, the day came of sentencing and my lawyer struck a deal with the prosecution and said, my client, Mr. Noble, is willing to plead guilty to 10 charges if you would drop the rest. And so that's basically what occurred. And I remember, I'll just, I'll just tell you this one short story because I, I think it's really powerful. Um, at the 11th hour, well, not literally, but it was about 10.30 um, in the morning. There, um, it was the day of sentencing. I didn't have to say anything, but I got up in the witness stand and I, I remember saying to the judge, I said, oh, I just wanted to apologise for my behaviour. I want to um, reiterate that, you know, I've become a Christian and, and I'm going to church and, and um, I've got, I was, I was on bail for almost two years, so I had Clean Up Australia Day certificates. I had Salvation Army door knock certificates. I had a cert one in screen printing. I had um, two or three pastoral references from some um, great godly men who knew me before and after my change and were able to vouch for my character. My family was in the courtroom and... And so I just it's clear you're trying to turn things around. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I had a stat deck saying that I was declaring to get married the next month mm. in January. Um, and I had, um, I also had a, what was it, a stat deck. And I had documents proving my intention to join the military at the time. Mm. So I had all this stuff and I think the judge was like, okay, um, I'm happy to, uh, well, she didn't say this, but I think she was like, oh, I think it's a waste of resources to put this person in jail. There's clearly a change. and um, But the prosecution was also obviously get their chance to cross-examine me, and they were trying to make me out like I was the head of a graffiti gang and that I was violent and aggressive, and it just it just didn't stand up. It was all falling through. I feel like their, their case didn't hold because of the proof that we had of my character um, and the nature of my offences, these kinds of things. And so... Um, it came to the end of my time, and what happened was the prosecution. I just think this is this is almost like a like a movie scene. The, uh, the prosecution at the end there was um, the judge was about to pass sentencing, and they say and she says, "Look, it's um, you know, it's about quarter to ten. Oh, I'm going to make my ruling at about ten o'clock, um, and then and we'll do this." And, and the prosecution said, "Oh, Your Honour." Um, the, head pro uh, the head of this case is bringing evidence from Sydney Central, but he's stuck in traffic. We'd just like to show you the, some footage of, of the damage that Mr Noble's done, to show you the magnitude and, the, and you know, the, um, the heinousness of the crimes and all this. And she just said, oh, look, if it's not here by 10 o'clock, um, it won't be necessary. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was about four or five, six minutes past 10, and um, the, head um, the head prosecutor of the case comes in, and he's like puffed, he's got a case of evidence, he's dressed in his police uniform and, and the prosecutor goes, oh, Your Honour, um, uh, the evidence is here, can we please display this? And she says, oh yeah, it's after 10, oh, um, don't worry about it. And he's like, but it's only six minutes past, I'm surely, and, she, and she's like, sit down, prosecution. And he was like, yes, yes, Your Honour, you know, and sat down and I was just like, whew, it's like intense in mm -hmm. here, you know. Um, it was just like saved by grace again, you know, there was just this grace to grace, even though I knew I was going to get sentenced in some way. Mm. Um, and in the end, um, I did get sentenced. I got uh, 150 hours of community service. Mm -hmm. And my lawyer was expecting a suspended jail sentence at the least. That they might have got like uh, maybe like two months in jail or six months in jail, these mm. things. So again, I think I got grace uh, upon grace. Uh, sounds like a title of a good book. Mm. And... Um, so that's 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 chapter, yeah. Wow. And so it's one thing to um, 
to for this this pivotal point in terms of your own spiritual journey. It's another thing, I guess, to end up now looking at Christian ministry. And so you went to the yeah. army. You said after sentencing, yep. um, got married, presumably <laughs> after that as well. But yep. where, where did the where did the stepping stone into some form of Christian ministry first happen, though? Yep, yep. So um, about six months after I got married, I joined the military, and we moved from North Richmond, which is where we lived. Um, in the Hawkesbury in Sydney, and we moved to uh, Melbourne after I did my basic training. We moved to Melbourne. I was there for about a year or so, and then I moved back to Sydney. Um, it was, actually, I changed careers. I was playing drums in the army band for a little while. I didn't like it. I transferred to a different uh, career. I tried um, being uh, working in logistics, and I really liked it, actually. It was quite enjoyable, and so I did that. Um, altogether, I was in the army for five years. When I moved back to Sydney, by accident, I, or just by chance, I started going to a church called Resolved, which is, um, uh, if I had to put a label on it, it was kind of Anglican, Reformed, even though it was officially uh, non-denominational. But the pastor, um, Hans Christensen, was the pastor then. And when I started going there, um, uh, the connection was through um, a guy called um, Paul Liao, and he was the singer of a band called Seven Steady. They were a really cool mm -hmm. alternative rock band. They're actually very good. Uh, I don't think the band's together anymore, but they were amazing. And we played, I was in a band called Same Old Story, and we both um, did, we played together at Easter Fest in 2009. And so that was the connection. And I said to him backstage, I said, next month I'm moving to Sydney. And he goes, oh, hey, come to this church that I'm at. It's really cool. It's called Resolved. It meets in a house. And like a month or two later, when I got there, they had moved into, I think it was Newtown Community Center in Newtown. And basically, we were there at that church for the next four years. Mm. And so that was the beginning of my, um, I would say, you know, I was a Christian and I would happily tell people I was a Christian. But it was going to this church that I just, I really started to... Um, mature very quickly in my faith and my theology. And um, Hans Christensen, he's an, he's an amazing man of God. He preaches very well. He's uh, trained at Moore College in Sydney. And he would start his sermons with generally with a quote or something very profound, like John Calvin says this, or um, Charles Spurgeon says this, or Jonathan Edwards says this. And I'd be like, man, that is, that is profound, what that comment was. And then he would start a sermon preaching the text. It was generally expository and very reformed. Um, you know, uh, excellent, excellent preaching. And I would say it was through the feeding of God's word that I grew massively. Mm. Um, but uh, one thing I must tip my hat to with the guys at Resolved, they, um, um, another guy I called Arnaldo Santiago. He's Puerto Rican. He's from Brooklyn, New York. And he was uh, an elder at Resolved as well. And he was, at the time, was working at Kurong. And he, had, he was able to buy... Um, a stack of like Galatians commentaries and gave one to everyone in the church. And we all went through this as our Bible study. Mm. So we would read the text and we would all through the week had homework to read the commentary. And it's like, I've never been forced to read a Bible commentary before. And I was like, how does the author know this? Like, how does he know the, like the geography and demographics of the area? How does he know like the, the theological background and all this stuff? And like, um, it blew my mind and I opened my eyes to scholarship and, ac and academia mm. But again, like, I think I took a, just a steep theological learning curve. And over that four years, I was reading, like, you know, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, John Calvin's The Institute, Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And um, I, just, I just kept reading, and I would just say to Hans, what can you give me to read? And he'd go, I recommend this. And I'd be like, I'll do it. And I would read it, and we would discuss it. And I think I just grew massively, which basically, in the last year or two there, I was coming to the end of my time in the Army, and I said to... Um, hands. I said, I really feel called to go into ministry. Um, I was thinking of military chaplaincy for a long time, mm. but to do that, you still need to go to Bible college. You still need to have a degree. You need to have five years generally of church ministry full time. Um, I was doing a lot of evangelism work um, in my time in the army. So every weekend I would go and do Christian hip hop ministry with my wife. And so we did that for a number of years, but I still felt this chipping away my soul to do something more formal, at least studying the Word of God on a formal level. And so um, I knew a couple guys that had been to Ridley College. In um, I was thinking of more, but I think Ridley, I, I knew, um, I don't want to work with a guy called um, Andrew Grills. He's a um, he's currently a pastor at um, of the church plant City on a Hill, Geelong, with Guy Mason and those guys. But before that, he was... Um, he was an Anglican minister ordained and working as a chaplain for like, I think, eight years or something like this in the military. And I spent a lot of time with him, probably like 
200 hours, I would say, um, volunteering with the military under his wing and watching him administer communion to soldiers um, and preaching to soldiers with his authority. You know, I was there and, 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 um, and every time I'd ask him a question, he was able to answer it. Like I would say, oh, what do you think about eschatology? And he'd be like, oh, this is what you learn at Bible college. What do you think about the doctrine of election? Well, he'd be like, oh, here's all the big arguments. And I'd be like, how does he know this? And it's just because he went to Bible college. And he's like, Peter, I, th I thoroughly recommend you go. And so he'd been to Ridley. And so um, I knew uh, some guys down there. I, I kind of knew um, Reese Bazant down there. He's a lecturer in um, uh, history and um, uh, church ministry and sacraments and this kind of things. So for me, it was like, uh, a natural step and I, I spoke to hands and I had the blessing of resolve to go uh, to, to, of the church and so it was sad to go but it was like a good send off mm. and that was um, so I I, I, uh, I discharged from the military after five years and I finished my time with resolve after four years I was serving with them quite a lot and then I went to I, I went down to uh, Melbourne did th a three year BTH through Ridley College now, before yeah. we get to more about um, Ridley and the journey from there, just to go back a step to the hip-hop ministry, and tell us a little bit more about, you know, again, for those of you who aren't familiar with this sort of scene, that, well, what did this look like for you and what were you yep. actually doing? Yeah, so it kind of started when I was in the military because I had finished up doing, I was in punk bands for a little while, and so I was doing that for about three or four years, but when I joined the army, I still had, an, I, I kind of finished the bands, and I wanted to do something, I wanted to turn my an initiative away from graffiti into other, towards other elements of hip-hop, and so I started getting into um, into rapping. I was always into rap music and that. And so I thought, I said to my wife, um, do you want to start a hip hop crew? And so we started a group called Dying To Be Alive. Um, and it was based on, you know, those who um, give up their life will find it, you know, and, and, and those who, you know, but those who try to save it will lose it. And so basically um, I said, I, I, it was just, a, a, I think a ministry that had, that, that God just kind of put on my heart for a time. And we did that for about six, seven years. Um, yeah, well, it was kind of like I was into hip-hop before I joined the Army as well, but, but I say maybe for five years officially, at least while I was in the military. Mm -hmm. And then even after I left the military, I still did a few gigs. But, so but schools, churches, right, camps, that sort of right, stuff. Right, right. So, um, and so basically, um, it, in a nutshell, it was like a parachurch ministry. Mm -hmm. We would go into um, schools and youth groups and churches and basically... The product that we have is that we would perform something like a song, a hip hop song, and or I could preach as well. So I was able to preach in that capacity um, or give a gospel related message. And it could be any length. It could be one song and a five minute talk. It could be um, 40 minutes of music and maybe a five minute talk, or it could be a, um, a performance and a sermon. It could be anything. Mm. And we did about three or four albums over the years and so the albums are like gospel tracks it has the gospel message on it um, probably more of a reformed theological um, nature but um, yeah and I, I think God really honoured that like we did a lot of cool stuff um, oh yeah we probably played it in about I would say about yeah maybe two, 200 to 300 schools over the five six years and probably like 200 to 250 churches I think and so there was and, and, and like um and tons of like street gigs as well. We had like lots of portable gear and we would take our own PA system with us. We had all our own equipment and we would just set up in like some of the strangest gigs we've done. Like we, we played in like, um, um, you know, Roxby Downs. Actually, yes, yeah, some of the highlights of, of, of my career there would be um, we did a, a support act for Justice Crew mm -hmm. who was also, we were also playing at a, a William Graham event, which is um, Billy Graham's grandson. And so we, we played there and it was like 500 youth and got to perform for them and um, the gospel was proclaimed quite um, uh, faithfully. And um, I also won a $10,000 grant at one point, mm. which, is, which we used. I said that um, it was through Mission Travel. Um, Lisa Tazia, I believe, is the CEO of Mission Travel. And so she, she, she used to run this every two years. And we won like the I won the largest amount you could get for an individual, and I couldn't believe it. But I pretty much put together a two thousand word document saying what I would do with this money if they gave it to me, and I just outlined that I would do a gospel centered tour. It was very missional. What it fitted all the, it, it fitted it fit all of the criteria of what they were looking for in terms of is what we're doing gospel centered, and it was very missional, even though it was um, it was national. It wasn't international as such. Mm. And we just took the gospel into those places, and um, uh, we did a so. So for that tour, we did it. I think it was um, was it two thousand and 
14, 15, I was um, working as a youth minister in the Anglican church at the time. And I took one of my youth leaders with me on the tour and my wife went and we had two kids at the time and we took a trailer and we get, I think I said, we would do 32 shows in 30 days. And that was pretty cool. And, and we, yeah, we went. Busy time. You're very busy. Mm. But God bless that. And um, I still sometimes get emails today from mm. people saying, oh, I was listening to your CD the other day and I gave it to a friend. And now they, they want to get baptized and these kinds mm. of things. So just create, and there's a lot of fruit that you don't see, but there's a lot mm. of fruit you do see. So, And certainly yeah. music's still a part of um, Pete's life and, and ministry potentially. We might come back to that later on. But, yeah. So gr- grew up in this Pentecostal home. Um, graffiti in the teen years, court, um, the army, um, you have this hip-hop ministry, um, non-denominational type churches. How on earth does a guy like you, down to Ridley, end up in the Lutheran, studying for the Lutheran ministry? Oh my goodness, yeah, okay. So um, I think it started with my theological studies at Ridley, and I had a good grounding of sacramental theology uh, being taught by Reese Bazant, uh, Dr. Bazant at Ridley. And so we unpacked like all the major views on the Lord's Supper. I would say this is where everything hangs on. And so we looked at, you know, the Catholic Church, we looked at Zwingli, we looked at Luther, we looked at um, John Calvin. So I guess like that kind of represents the mm-hmm. broad, the major strokes of sacramental theology. And so I sort of sat, spent a lot of time thinking about this. And um, I think I think Ridley College teaches all those views very faithfully. And the more that I looked at it, I think, I didn't think much of it. So I had the knowledge But when it came to actual ministry and applying this sacramental theology in a practical way, I was working at um, Berwick Anglican Church for a year um, in 2016. And so I found that whenever I was working with, um, in ministry, um, just in this context, like, so youth would, uh, people would come to me and the question would just, for for argument's sake, would be something like, how do I know that I'm saved? And, or how can I be assured that I'm saved? And so these practical questions are very real and they're very um, conscience-driven for the people, um, for parishioners. And, and, I, and, and basically, um, for me, I was like, well, what do you think? You know, or like, you know, what is actually, I would just say, the first thing I would say is, well, what has Jesus done for you? And I get them to answer the question mm-hmm. and I would just be pointing them to um, their baptism or I would get them to think about it, and they would go, well, I've been baptized, you know, in this church. And I'll be like, well, what does baptism mean? And we'd unpack that. And the more that I looked at um, the sacraments, and because, um, I mean, like, I, a good Protestant answer is, well, hey, you need to look into the Word of God, and the Word of God needs to confirm it for you. Now, that's true in one mm-hmm. sense, but um, it still relies on you searching it out and those kinds of things. But um, but the gospel in uh, the book of Concord, and I've got one here, talks about the gospel in the narrow sense and in the broad sense. Mm-hmm. And the narrow sense is that um, um, Christ has died for you, full stop. And that, that's the gospel. He's paid for your sin. Uh, but, the, but the broad sense is the gospel talks about you know, all, all, all of the teaching of Christ. And, and um, that's a, a very brief par- mm-hmm. paraphrase. But basically, I would get that person to come to a point where they would see that there's nothing they can do to earn their salvation, but it's what Christ has done. Where is the clearest point in their life, objectively, where Christ has come to them? Well, it comes to them in word and sacrament, um, particularly in their baptism. And so by the time the conversation was finished, they would say things like, well, actually, I am saved. Jesus has baptized me. You know, um, he has done this. Um, I'm receiving the Lord's Supper. I'm receiving Christ's body and blood. And so um, what am I really saying here? Well, what I'm saying is I was, I was basically saying that baptism saves a person. This mm-hmm. is, and that um, is means is when Jesus says, this is my body. It doesn't represent it, but I'm actually present here and I'm giving you my flesh and blood through the elements of bread and wine. So um, not, not quite the emphasis you usually hear in those sort of circles that you're no. in. No. And mm-hmm. so while I have a lot of love and respect and patience for my Christians and brothers in Anglican circles, um, in my experience, in the you know, four years I've been in you know, Melbourne uh, Anglican diocese circles and probably four years in Sydney uh, resolved Anglican circles there because um, it was mostly Anglican people that were mm. attending that church, um, I've never heard anyone use the, t- uh, the, the, the terminology baptism saves you and that Christ's true body and blood or his real presence is there and it actually is forgiving sins. It is a performative word. It does what it says and says what it does. And so for me... Um, so uh, part of this story about joining the Lutheran Church is, um, yeah, so I, um, I'll, I'll come up to this. Um, what I was doing in academic language, applying 
Lutheran theology in practical pastoral care. That, that, that's what I was doing. Mm. Now, I realized I was doing that the more I started to read Lutheran confessions. And I picked up, um, it, was actually this, it was actually this book of Concord. Um, um, I, bought, I, I bought a library off a guy, and his name was um, Brett Mullen. And he's in here. I'm sure he wouldn't mind because it's, 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 he's in here. And he's a, um, Brett Mullen is a Luther scholar. And he sold me his library for whatever reason, got out of academics. And um, not, I've actually never met him, um, but I have some of his books uh, that he's written. But he sold his library. There was about 2,000 books, and I just bought it through Gumtree. I think he was living in Perth. And I bought this library off him in my second year in my undergraduate studies at Ridley. And in that library was a book of Concord. There was a Lutheran hymnal supplement. Um, there was a Lutheran red book of rights. There was a blue pastoral care book of rights. Um, Helmut Tierlicki, Hermann Zusser, tons of stuff, tons of Lutheran writings, um, lots of German texts, and um, lots of Latin. And so basically, um, I started to read this. I was aware of this, and I remember just opening it up and just pouring over different things, uh, particularly the formula of Concord. And I remember reading it, thinking to myself, being awestruck, going, oh my goodness, the, what these guys are talking about, the, the theological arguments, this could be written today. Mm. You know, it's like, it's relevant right now, <laughs> you know, and it was written 500 years ago in like mm. 1580. Um, so basically... And what's so fascinating yeah. for me about you, you know, this, <laughs> this part of your journey is that, you know, the, the, it's, it's often noted by scholars how the whole Lutheran Reformation really arises out of a pastoral concern, you know, for people's consciences. Yeah, right. And, and right. What, I, what I hear in your own journey, this is how, this was the, the stimulus for you as well, is the pastoral concern for these young people. And, it, yeah, you know. I, th I think you've actually nailed it, yeah, and I probably haven't really put two and two together like that. Um, but I think it's, um, yeah, I think it, it, it would be driven mostly, yeah, by my, by my own conscience and my own concern for the person in the pew. Um, and the more that I looked into the Book of Concord, the more I looked into Lutheran theology, um, there was a book, I think it was the Book of Concord, but specifically a book called um, This Is My Body by Hermann Zasse. And he really unpacks the history and the theology of the, the Lord's Supper. And, he, and um, obviously his, uh, um, his thesis, uh, his, um, uh, the conclusion that he arrives at is that, you know, it's a mystery that Jesus is present in the Holy Supper. But he really doesn't mince his words. He, he, he just kept going back to Scripture. And every time I, heard, I was reading the argument, I was like, how is this possible or what's going on here? But um, the more that I looked into it, I was like, actually, there's so much more going on with this meal uh, then meets the eye. But that, um, uh, I think reading him, and then I, from him I started looking at other writings like John Kleinig. Um, there's a document, if you get a chance to read it, it's called The Self-Localization of God. It's published in a fest shrift for Peter Skeyer, or Skeyer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, uh, it's probably hard to find, but it's published in a few different for formats. Um, if you can get a hold of that, it's really good. But it's basically like, you know, how does God choose to reveal himself? Well, he's localized with Moses on top of the mountain, and he reveals himself, you know, like, God is everywhere, but he's specifically in this place. Um, how does God, you know, reveal himself to, um, you know, David, King David? Well, you know, he's in the um, Ark of the Covenant, and, you know, he's specifically located there in the Tent of Meeting. And then you move to the New Testament. Where is God? Well, he's self-localized fully in the person of Jesus. He reveals himself in a very specific way to his disciples that he does to no one else. When you move beyond Jesus' death and resurrection to today, like how does God choose to self-localize himself? In, the, in word and sacrament. And so um, it's just like the more I'm, I look into Lutheran theology, the more I'm persuaded and, con and convicted and convinced that... Um, of what the Lutheran Church talks about, but even just the language they use, like I haven't heard it spoken about respectfully in other uh, denominations. Like, so the Lutheran Church uses, um, uh, if you can see here, uh, it says, you know, the confessions of the Luther of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. So they would say it's a, conf a confessional church, which means it has what it believes. It confesses um, both publicly and privately, and that. Um, the Lutheran Church was born out of a confession in terms of it confessed its faith before the emperor, King mm. Charles V, and, uh, and the papacy um, in, you know, say, the, uh, the, you know, right back from like the, uh, the Deed of Worms with Luther, 1521, through to 1530 with the Augsburg Confession, Philip Melanchthon, um, he very cheekily, tongue-in-cheek says, you know, at the beginning of the confessions, he says, um, I will confess before 
kings and rulers and not be put to shame, like mm. quoting from the Psalms. Mm. And so I look at that and I just go, man, here's a people. Um, uh, and again, Herman Zasser talks about confessing. This is the, um, if, if Herman Zasser would say anything, he would say, um, his, the, I say he, his life's thesis statement would be that um, confessing and union go together. That if you're talking about Christian unity or the church, that those who, have the, who confess the same faith um, will be in union. You know, so you cannot have union without confession, which is very different to unionism, which is basically, oh, we're all united through our differences. You know, we're not really, um, we don't really have to believe the same thing. We're just united because, because we're different, you know? And it's like, mm. there's no confession there. There's no union there. It's just a unionism. It's, it's, it's a false pretense of union. So, so again, you know, um, the terminology that the Lutheran Church uses, I've been, I found at first quite confronting, but the more that I've looked at it and compared it with God's word, you start going back through like John 6, you know, Jesus is like, my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Um, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 about the Lord's Supper, he doesn't say those who, um, he says that those who do not discern the body and blood are guilty of the bread and wine. No, he says they're guilty of the body and blood of Christ. It's like really powerful language. So I had to just sit with that for a couple of years and the more that I reflected on it I was like I think I'm a Lutheran and I think I, I feel like I or I, I feel like I'm called to become a pastor still I was pursuing ordained ministry thinking about it very deeply in Anglican terms but um, it led to a phone call to uh, your father actually Andrew Pfeiffer Dr. Pfeiffer at, at the seminary and I said to and him how was that for you Pete? yeah good it went something <laughs> like this I said I said um I called him at about November 2016 and I said is this Dr. Pfeiffer he's like yes I said, um, my name's Peter. Um, I think I think God wants me to pursue to being a pastor in the Lutheran Church. And he's like, Oh, really? Oh, okay. Um, are you a Lutheran? And I'm like, Not yet. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and he basically just said, Oh, well, you know, come back, you know, join a Lutheran Church and give me a call back in a year. And I was like, Oh, actually, I work full time for the Anglican Church. I don't think I can do this. Um, he said, I said, but I, but I have read the Book of Concord, and I have, a, and I, I actually have, a, you know, a, an LHS, and I have a, I, I listed all these books to him, and he was like, oh, and I said, look, I would quite happily make that my own confession, right? And I was, I feel, I think I was, I felt like I was speaking his language, and so he organized a meeting for me to go see um, the Bishop of Victoria, which was Greg Peach at the time, and um, and Brett Kennett. And I went in there with a suit and tie, put my game face on, and I just confessed my faith. And I said, here's a pile of books that I've read that I write Lutheran theology. Ask me anything about them. And, and they were like, oh, this is going to be an interesting meeting, you know. And, of course, the rest is history. Um, mm. I came to the seminary, Australian Lutheran College, and, uh, and I've been studying. And they basically put together an accelerated course for me to study there and um, really looked at what, what are the holes in Peter's minute, um, uh, theological and uh, formation vocational training that he needs to, to become a, uh, uh, a sufficient minister in the Lutheran Church. And so I have to, again, tip my hat to some of the guys there, um, particularly Andrew Pfeiffer and um, Stephen Peach, for just really getting alongside me and just um, working with me. Uh, and also Timothy Ebbs as well. He's a pastor out at Glenelg. Um, and just these guys that just um, have done nothing but just l love me and serve me and encourage me, and um, I can bring my questions to them, my concerns, and I just feel like um, they've really allowed me to, um, or I guess they allow all students to really test what the Book of Concord has to say on its own merit concerning mm. God's Word. And so um, I wouldn't you know, say to someone, oh, you know, the Book of Concord stands true. I would just say, just read it and, and for yourself, you know. Um, and uh, so I'm quite comfortable with it, and I'm comfortable with uh, Lutheran theology. It, it's 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 robustness and it's rigor, and um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's been a, it's been it's been massive. But yeah, it's quite a journey. We're through through vicarage now, and Pete's looking forward to um, to ordination. <laughs> God willing, at the end of this year, and yeah. it really is quite a quite a journey, Pete. And um, and we we appreciate you sharing it with us here today, and. Mm. Um, and we're thankful to God that for the journey He's led you on, He's led you to this place, and um, and that you can use your gifts and your all your experiences from the past now, yeah. in, you know, in in um, our little corner of the of the of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the, so. the center of the universe. <laughs> the no, no, so, that's um, right. Yeah. 
as I said earlier, Pete's still involved in various projects and some to do with music as well, and um, it's worth checking out some of his um, clips online. Lutheran All Star is one that oh, gets yeah. around. You could probably stick the link. Probably yeah, we can put the link the in YouTube that. YouTube thing. It's worth having a look at. And um, yeah, yeah. Pete, just thanks again for being here. God oh, bless you. Thank you very much. God bless you, and I'm sure I'll see you all around the wider LCA. God bless. Mm -hmm.